Uh, how's it been? It's been good? Good? Glad to hear it. Um, it's been really great for me to be here. I've enjoyed this so much. Uh, I've been so thankful to meet many of you. There's still many more that I have not met. So I can be really shy, uh, but I would, I would love to meet all of you. Um, so if I don't come talk to you, please come talk to me if you like. I would love to, to chat. Um, always looking to meet more Rubius and uh, just love this community. So thanks. Um, <clears throat> so today, last talk here. Welcome to Making It as an Indie Developer, Secrets of the Fire Swamp. When I was a teenager growing up in the 90s, this was my favorite movie. I think I had the entire script memorized at one point. So it's embedded pretty deeply in my brain, and there are parts of this movie that still spring to mind decades later. Here's one of those parts. Wesley and Buttercup are being chased by the evil Prince Humperdinck. To avoid capture, they enter the fire swamp, a dangerous forest that almost everyone avoids. There they encounter the three terrors of the fire swamp, the flames spurt, the lightning sand, and the ROUSs, the rodents of unusual size. They manage to survive each one and emerge on the far side of the forest where they're surprised by Prince Humperdinck and his men. Humperdinck commands them to surrender, but then Wesley replies, ah, but how will you capture us? We know the secrets of the fire swamp. We can live there quite happily for some time. I've thought about this scene quite often over the years. It's become a kind of personal metaphor for how gaining knowledge and building uh, risk tolerance can grant you access and even a degree of safety and comfort to a place that most people would consider unlivable. And in that place, you may discover a new kind of freedom, uh, freedom from the defaults or the conventions found on the outside. Working for yourself is a little bit like the fire swamp. It's unpredictable, uh, it can be dangerous, and most people avoid it. Uh, but I'd like to propose that if you can learn the secrets, be comfortable with the risk, and protect your downside, you can live there quite happily for some time. Please know, I'm not suggesting that every employer is Prince Humperdinck trying to make you suffer in the pit of despair, though I can empathize if you do feel that way. Instead, I'm trying to suggest that traditional employment is a default that we sometimes accept because the fire swamp seems unlivable. And what I want to convince you of today is simply that it is livable. Not that you have to do it, not that you have to leave your full-time job if you have one that you, that you love, but simply that the fire swamp could be a reasonable option for you once you learn its secrets. And so, if you are an indie developer already, you may be well ahead of me, uh, but I'm hoping that you come away from this talk with an insight for a challenge you're facing or a new idea to inspire you. If you are curious and considering the indie path, I want to lay out a framework for uncovering and managing the unknowns of working on your own. And if you're happily employed, I want to offer you a reasonable backup plan, just in case something in your life or work changes. So, hello, I'm Jeremy Smith. I'm a designer, developer, and I run a tiny one-person web studio especially specializing in Rails application development, uh, currently serving solo uh, founders with SaaS products. Uh, I've been working on my own since 2013. Uh, I live in Greenville, South Carolina, in the eastern part of the U.S. with my family, my wife Christy, and our three kids, ages 17, 15, and 11. I'm also the co-host of the Indie Rails podcast with my good friend Jess Brown. Uh, here's a recent interview with Adam McRae of Judah Scale, or as you may know, uh, Rails Auto Scale. And I'm the lead organizer for Blue Ridge Ruby, a uh, new Ruby conference that was held back in June in the mountains of North Carolina. Now, you may still be wondering why you should listen, me, listen to me, so let me also tell you what I'm not. I'm not a 10x developer. I've been building web applications for about 20 years, but I would guess I'm a pretty average senior level developer. I'm not a high energy, high output person. There are some really high output people in the world. It's taken me a long time to realize it, but I'm not one of them. Uh, I can't grind it out at a full time job, work on a side project or venture, and then still take care of myself and my family. And I'm not a big risk taker. I have had lots of dreams and schemes, but I don't have a naturally high risk tolerance. I get stressed out easily, and I often doubt myself. Despite that, 
I've managed to make it on my own for 10 years, uh, exercising a great amount of control over uh, when and where I work, taking a more active role in choosing projects and clients, and pursuing a number of personal and professional goals that would have been difficult or impossible for me, at least, with a regular full-time job. For example, uh, when our kids were little, I helped my wife to homeschool them. I attended urban farm school for three days a week uh, for seven months while doing client work part-time. On the side, I built an online video platform to teach people agriculture and homesteading skills and helped to produce several of the courses, video courses that we sold. Uh, I've taken our family on several long cross-country trips uh, across the U.S. during our summers, which is hard to do with a standard two-week vacation in the U.S. And as I mentioned, I've organized a, a Ruby conference for the first time this year. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. None of those things may be interesting or impressive to you, uh, but I hope it at least shows you that taking the indie path can allow ordinary developers to pursue dreams that might be difficult or impossible with a regular job. So now I want to lay out a framework for making it as an indie developer. Uh, these are the secrets of the fire swamp. Knowing and preparing well for these can help you avoid ruinous surprise. Now, I say making it intentionally and not crushing it or killing it because the goal first and foremost is simply to make it, uh, to not fail, to protect your downside and survive. I learned this framing recently from Daniel Vassallo uh, in his portfolio of small bets course. Daniel is well known for quitting his high paying uh, job as a software engineer at Amazon to go work for himself. He says, when you move from regular employment to self-employment, you move from the predictable world to the stochastic or unpredictable world. And, <clears throat> and your tactics for operating in the unpredictable world have to be different. The goal is to focus on survival and avoiding a game over scenario. So with that, here are the keys. Knowing your why, making the transition, managing yourself, finding customers, and thinking like a business. Let's start with knowing your why. When I was in my late 20s, I dreamed of buying and renovating a fixer-upper. Uh, my wife and I bought this 100-year-old rundown uh, house in a historic cotton mill village. 100 years may not seem old in Europe, but it's ancient by US standards. Uh, <laughs> we had just uh, had our second child. It was late 2008, and the housing market had just crashed. And I spent nine months of nights and weekends working on this disgusting little house with almost no construction experience. Uh, the worst was on the inside. I spared you those pictures. <laughs> I exhausted myself physically, emotionally, mentally, uh, relationally, financially to pull off this project. And many nights I lay awake asking myself, why? Why did I do this to myself? Why did I think this was a good idea? What was the point of all this effort? And in the end, my reasons weren't sufficient for the difficulty. We finished the renovation and lived in that house for the next several years, but I burnt out on that project. And to this day, I have no interest in even the smallest home improvement task. I don't even want to hang a picture. Um, many things in life will be hard, um, but when you pick an unconventional professional path, it's crucial that, that you know why you're making the choice. Uh, if you're like me, you didn't grow up with entrepreneurial parents, so regular full-time employment is probably your default, and working for yourself is an unconventional path. So you need to make sure you lay out your reasons ahead of time. Here's some examples. I want uh, greater control over when and where I work. I need time to care for children or elders. I want time to pursue a, building a product or a service. Um, I need time to pursue educational and personal goals that would have been difficult, uh, might conflict with a full-time job. Uh, I want greater control over the projects I take on, or I need the ability to tailor my role uh, to my own unique skills and interests. These reasons can stack together to form a foundation for your motivation. Knowing your why gives you the following benefits. It sets a clear direction to head in. It helps you know what you're aiming at before you venture out on your own. It helps you to make decisions that move you closer to your goal. It gives you boundaries to operate within. It's easy to get sidetracked by both the opportunities and the challenges that come up, sending you in unexpected directions. Uh, it helps you know what you will and won't do. It clarifies your story for yourself and for others. 
We make meaning by telling ourselves and others the story of our lives, both personally and professionally. Knowing your why helps you to tell that story. It gives you a way to position yourself in the marketplace, and it helps you to connect to clients, customers, and others. And finally, it protects your motivation. It reminds you of what, what you already decided matters to you and why you chose this path. It helps you build internal resolve that will help protect you from panic and burnout. Making the transition. I used to play a lot of Minecraft. If you haven't played before, Minecraft is a 3D sandbox game. And sandbox games give you a high level of creative freedom without a single main objective. You can explore the world map, build structures, collect supplies, interact with other players. And in survival mode, you can be attacked by hostile mobs and die. For those of you who have played, think about when uh, players are most vulnerable in the game. I would say it's when the sun sets on their first day. You see, the secret that beginners don't yet know is that they have to get busy collecting food, supplies, weapons, and tools, and building a shelter before that first nightfall. But most beginners just wander around, exploring without a strategy, and before they know it, night has fallen, and they're being attacked by zombies with no way to defend themselves. Experienced plans, players, on the other hand, get to work on those goals of gathering resources, knowing the terrain, and building defenses as soon as they spawn into a new world so they're ready when night comes. If you make the jump to indie development, you need a strategy for your transition that will protect you when you're most vulnerable and increase your odds of success. Uh, like Minecraft, it includes gathering resources, knowing the terrain, and building defenses as soon as possible. Much of this could and should be done before you leave employment. The best way I can illustrate this is with an example. So here's just one strategy that could help you transition from a regular full-time job into an indie development with a reduced risk. This is a strategy assumes that you have a relatively stable full-time job, you enjoy or at least tolerate the work and the people, and you have some extra reserve of time and energy. First, if you haven't done this already, focus on make yourself, making yourself indispensable at the current job. I'd suggest reading Seth Godin's book, Lynchpin, and Cal Newport's book, So Good They Can't Ignore You. Second, outside of your job, start practicing the skills that so many developers hate. Relationship building, aka networking, marketing, and sales. I'm assuming you've already developed and have strong software development and project management skills, so you need to work on what's missing. I'll be talking more about this in another part of the framework, but you have to acquire these skills, and the best time to work on them is before your livelihood depends on it. Third, land a long-term part-time client that you could sustainably keep even with your full-time job. This may be a difficult period where you're having to work a lot, but it will help you build a financial cushion that will come in handy later. This last part is the riskiest, but there's always some risk. Go to your employer and tell them that you intend to go out on your own, but that you would love to find a way to continue to work with them, but in a reduced capacity. Present a plan for how you could keep delivering the value they care most about, but in less hours. If this works, transition your relationship from employment to freelance contract, and you now have two long-term clients. If this doesn't work, you may need to try again later or look for a second client and make the transition then. This may need to be adapted to your situation or it may not work for you at all, but the point is you can create a transition plan that will reduce your risk exposure and help you work ahead of that transition to put yourself in the best position for succeeding. Whatever you do, don't jump from full-time employment into indie development with cold sales and marketing. You need uh, a network, you need leads coming in, and you need uh, some clients and customers. You should be seeing a flow of interest before you jump. Also, you want to split your risk across at least a couple clients. You need to, have to practice not having all of your work a lot, time allotted to a single customer, and you need to have redundancy in your income streams. Managing yourself. When I started out building web applications, I did some things that are unthinkable to me now. I didn't write automated tests, I didn't use exception tracking, and I had no performance monitoring or instrumentation. So when things broke, how do you think I found out? From either staff or, worse, from customers. This is the worst way to find out that something you made is broken. 
Uh, Over time, I learned that I wanted to be the first to know if there was a sign of a problem. If we were getting 500s in production, I wanted an alert. Uh, If there was a slow endpoint, I wanted to know before others complained about it. And ultimately, if there were bugs in my code, I wanted to know about them before they even got deployed. This might all seem obvious to you, but it's easy to forget to apply the same level of scrutiny to our own performance when you strike out on your own. Simply working hard isn't enough. You need to manage yourself. If you've always been an IC, congratulations, you've just become a manager. Uh, This isn't your full-time job, but it is a role that you must fill. Your clients and customers aren't going to do it for you. So what does it mean to manage yourself? At the most basic level, it means uh, that you're doing the work. Are you delivering the value uh, that your clients and customers expect? Are you keeping your commitments? Are you uh, earning enough income? You're already doing this to a a degree uh, in a regular job, but there won't be anyone checking in on you with those things to, that, to see how you're doing and make sure that you're working uh, when you're working on your own. So you need to be checking in regularly with, with yourself. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, second, improving a per- performance. The next level um, here uh, is improving your performance. While you may be delivering value, You may not be as efficient or effective as you could be. Um, At this level, you want to be looking at how to optimize your daily workflow. You want to be thinking about how to improve your communication with customers and clients. Uh, You want to find ways to build more trust and deliver more value, but in less time. And finally, this last level is, in my opinion, the biggest potential pitfall. Uh, And it was referenced yesterday in a really great way. Not taking care of your energy level and your emotional state uh, can sink you as an indie dev. Uh, Growing up, I internalized the following implicit message from people around me. Maybe you can relate to this. Work hard, don't complain, ignore the pain. There's a problem here. Ignoring the pain, physical, emotional, or relational, can lead to serious chronic injury. The pain is the 500s getting reported in your exception tracker. Uh, Maybe the occasional 500 is okay, but a high percentage is an emergency. Here's some examples. Anxiety around finances or project success. Loneliness due to isolation as a solopreneur. Fear or anger toward a client or a customer. Disappointment or depression over a failed endeavor. Exhaustion from overwork or stress. I've personally had to deal with all of those. I grew up thinking, uh, believing that attending to your emotional state and making time for self-care was a sign of, of a weakness. But as I've gotten older, I've become convinced it's a sign of health. And it's essential for an indie dev. Now I work hard to manage and monitor my emotional health and energy levels so they don't become a problem. You may not like to hear it, but good bosses and managers provide a structure and support uh, to your work life that you can't do without. Uh, You need to manage your time, your finances, your taxes, your client relationships, marketing channels, and business processes, as well as consider how you're doing emotionally and how well your work is fitting you, what skills need to be improved, what learning investments need to be made, and how to develop and achieve your long-term objectives. You will will, uh, need to manage the uh, more significant risk of anxiety and stress uh, from a greater sense of uncertainty, and you'll have to manage uh, also the increased risk of isolation and loneliness. Your strengths are what, you're, what you sell, but your weaknesses are what you build systems and defenses for. One of the best defenses I know is to find your own personal team. I recommend having someone in your life that can help you stay emotionally balanced uh, and healthy. This might be a partner or a therapist. Uh, I have both. I also recommend having someone in your life that can help you work through your business challenges. This might be a mastermind group, a business coach, or perhaps even someone you happen to start a part- podcast with. Finding customers. The most common question I get is, how do you find customers? And this is not a perfect analogy, but I realize it's a little like asking, how do you catch fish? And the answer is, it's complicated. There are different kinds of fish, and they are found in different places. So which kind of fish are you trying to catch? Just because you know the place doesn't mean you have the right bait or lures. Different fish need different bait. What kind of bait are you using? Just because you have the right bait doesn't mean you're casting properly. You may not be attracting their attention or you may be sending the wrong signals completely. What's your casting technique? 
Even when you get a bite, you may lose the fish when you try to reel it in. It takes patience, focus, and judgment. Are you reeling carefully? And just because you're doing everything right doesn't mean you're going to catch something every time. You may go days without a nibble. Are you being persistent? Now, here's where the analogy breaks down. With fishing, you are literally tricking the fish so you can eat it. With clients and customers, your marketing and sales should not be a trick, and the goal should be a meaningful and satisfying exchange between equals. So let me say it another way. You need to spend enough time in the right spots, earning attention authentically, with enough patience and persuasiveness to turn that attention into meaningful engagement, and ultimately making an invitation that leads to a buying decision. So let's talk about how you might do that. First, map your skills to market needs. I'm gonna share some examples from a service perspective, but this likely works if you're uh, selling a product. Whatever value you have to offer has to map to uh, needs, real needs that customers have. Uh, you could simply market yourself as a contract web developer, for example, but it will be harder to earn attention and differentiate yourself from others. Uh, it, would be, it would probably be better if you focus on one or more specific niches. Uh, take stock of your skills and your experience and determine what your best offerings might be. Here's some examples. Security audits for web applications, fractional CTO to early stage startups, application performance improvement service, developer coaching service, Salesforce integration specialist, Heroku to AWS migration service. Each offering may have a different set of potential customers, so the next steps you may have to do for each. Second, go where customers are. Now that you have an offering for a specific customer need, where do the people in that segment spend their time? Where do they network, learn, or get help? The answers may be social media like Twitter, LinkedIn, Reddit, private Slack or Discord communities, email newsletters, blogs, or podcasts, uh, local meetups or regional conferences, or marketplaces. Note that when I say customer here, I, it may not re be the final decision maker or even the purchaser. Uh, it's likely going to be the person with the felt need for what you have to offer who can get you to that decision maker. Third, earn attention and build trust. Now that you've found where your potential customers are, you need to find a way to authentically earn their attention. Uh, Seth Godin calls this permission marketing. He says, permission marketing is the privilege, not the right, of delivering anticipated, personal, and relevant messages to people who actually want to get them. It realizes that treating people with respect is the best way to earn their attention. When someone chooses to pay attention, they are actually paying you with something precious. How you earn attention depends on the location and the medium. It may mean sharing professional learnings on social media, answering technical questions on community forums, uh, writing blog posts that get picked up in, by email newsletters, pitching podcast hosts on a topic you'd like to discuss, uh, or organizing a dinner with people at a conference. Or it could be things that you create elsewhere and invite people to, starting your own email newsletter, building your own Discord community, or providing free office hours for tech leads. You will likely have to experiment. When you're just starting out, try to keep your experiments small with a tight feedback loop. You are looking for signs of interest and engagement from the people that you're trying to reach. Not everything is going to work, but when something doesn't work, try to figure out why. I struggled with this for several years, and this may seem overly simplistic, but this, this realization has helped me. If people aren't responding to what you're putting in the world, it could be because no one sees it. Or it could be that they see it, but they don't understand it. Or it could be that they understand it, but they don't care about it yet. Or it could be that they care, but they don't know how to respond or what to do. Or it could be that they know how to respond, but they have not yet been sufficiently persuaded. If you're trying to engage with people on social media or with blog posts or videos or newsletters or online communities, and you aren't getting a response, try to figure out where you're getting blocked, and then try to practice ways of getting past that blocker next time. Finally, make the pitch. You've earned attention of potential customers, but you still need to, be, uh, you still need to invite them to consider how you could meet their need. Uh, this is the pitch, and it often it involves a sales landing page, uh, but people need to find that somehow. The pitch is gonna be different for each medium. If it's a podcast interview, uh, you might share a service offering uh, to listeners at the end of the episode. If it's social media, you might make a pitch when you have an opening in your availability or when you announce the launch of a new product or service. If it's connections from a conference, it might be a follow-up call uh, to talk more about a project. 
At this point, it's a sales funnel. You are taking leads, all the people that have given you some kind of attention, turn, uh, turning some of them into prospects, engaging with them to determine a fit for your offering, and then turning some of them into customers, closing the deal and making the sale. Now, marketing and sales can be really scary, I get it, especially if you haven't practiced and your livelihood depends on it, but the good news for indie devs is you don't have to do nearly as much marketing and sales as big companies. If you're selling services, you don't have to fill nearly the pipeline as some 50-person agency, for example. And if you go after long-term engagements, you may only need to make a couple sales a year. And if you're selling products and it's just you, you don't have to make as nearly as many sales as if you had a team of full-time employees. Amy Hoy and Alex Hillman underscored this truth in their 30 by 500 course. You only need to deliver $30 per month worth of value to 500 customers to gross $180,000 per year. Thinking like a business. Another of my favorite movies from childhood is the Disney classic, Swiss Family Robinson. In the story, this family is making this sea voyage to New Guinea when they're uh, shipwrecked on a deserted island. After realizing they may not be rescued, they set about creating an elaborate treehouse as their home base. Now, they could have just stayed in their town on the beach, uh, watching and waiting for a passing ship, but instead, they set up the structures that would help them to settle into their new life. If you find yourself on the deserted island of self-employment, whether because you were shipwrecked or because you landed there on purpose, your best chance for long-term survival is not to sit on the shore waiting for rescue, but to set up a base and build the structures that will help you thrive. At the first stage, it's to expand your attention from your core technical work, software development, to all the parts of your business. We already talked about sales and marketing, but there's also bookkeeping, accounting, taxes, planning and forecasting, customer onboarding or client discovery, project management, client management, and customer support. You don't have to be an expert at all of these things, but you should be learning more about each one, creating processes for them, and getting help where you need it. What wasn't obvious to me when transitioning from employment to freelancing was how proactive I would need to be. As an employee, I was good at focusing on my role and delivering exactly what was asked of me. This just isn't sufficient as an indie dev. You have to think beyond what clients and customers are asking you and make sure that all the things that, are, that need to be done for your business are getting done. Uh, it might involve things like building relationships, sharing what, uh, what you're doing and learning, crafting and making pitches, staying in touch and over communicating, setting expectations, managing time and costs, forecasting and making projections, celebrating successes, advising and mentoring, doing your own research and discovery, running your own experiments, and hiring and paying for your own services. Now that you've expanded your scope of responsibility from that core technical work to all the work being done in your business, the next stage is to step outside it all and to go to work on your business rather than in your business. This concept comes from Michael Gerber's The E-Myth Revisited. He explains that people who start small businesses are often technicians, having developed some kind of uh, technical skill, whether it's baking, carpentry, or interior design. But that they make a fatal assumption. If you understand the technical work of the business, you understand a business that does the technical work. He goes on to say, there's nothing wrong with being a technician. There's only something wrong with a technician who, al who also owns a business. Because a as a technician turned business owner, your focus is upside down. The solution, he says, is to adopt the entrepreneurial perspective and look at your business as if it were its own product sitting on a shelf and competing uh, for the customer's attention with, from a whole shelf of other products. Here's the difference. The technician asks, what work has to be done? The entrepreneur asks, how must the business work? The technician sees the business as a place people work, creating internal solutions, resulting in income. The entrepreneur sees the business as a system for creating uh, customer outcomes, re resulting in profits. The technician starts with a vision of the present and intends to keep the future much the same. The entrepreneur starts with a vision of the future and attempts to change the present to match. The technician envisions the business in parts, the entrepreneurship, uh, the entrepreneur envisions the business as a whole. Uh, this isn't easy. I am still working on this myself. 
Uh, it's difficult to manage the core technical work, to, the constellation of other responsibilities, and then on top of that, to step outside the business. Uh, it, sometimes it feels safer and easier just to revert back to simply doing the work of the technician. But I believe that this is a necessary step to making it as an indie uh, developer long term. Thinking like a business is what protects your longevity. It's building the structures and processes that will help you prosper uh, for many years to come. Now that, you've learned the uh, now that you've learned the secrets of the fire swamp, how do you live there happily for some time? First, as, as long as you are able to avoid those traps of uh, self-employment and make a, de a decent living doing good work, there's no reason that you have to do anything else. But if you're ambitious or you tend to get bored easily, you will probably need a plan for how to level up. First, I would suggest watching your indicators or gauges. Here are the gauges I would consider you keeping an eye on. First, money, your cash flow and your reserves. Second, capability, your skill set, knowledge and ex expertise in a changing market. Interest, that's your own level of curiosity, enjoyment and attention. And impact, your broader long-term effect on other people, your community and the world. These indicators often rise and fall uh, independently of each other. For example, sometimes uh, you might go through a period where the money gauge is up, uh, your, so your income is high, your capability gauge is unchanged, but your interest gauge is down. You cannot force gauges to change directly, but you can treat them as important signals of what your solo business needs, and then you can make adjustments to your systems to change those gauges. While you're making those adjustments, trying to maximize those indicators, you may still feel like you don't know where you're going. If you were working in a company, there may be a, career, a clear career ladder for you to climb and a manager that's helping you progress. But when you're independent, there is no preset path and no one whose job it is to help you get there. You may not have a path, but you can find models. Seek out other indie developers that are doing work in a way that looks interesting to you and try to figure out how they've done it. Look for models that are both one to two years out from where you are, as well as those five to 10 years out. These are just a few examples from the Ruby world. Okay, from just starting out to seasoned indie dev, there are plenty of things, plenty of difficulties that can turn the dream into a nightmare. Uh, we've learned the secrets of the fire swamp, the protective measures we can take to keep from sink sinking our solo business, knowing your why, making the transition, managing yourself, finding customers, and thinking like a business. And we've taken a brief look at how to go beyond making it from surviving to thriving. Now I wanna leave you with some takeaways. If you are already an indie developer, did you see any place where you might not be protecting your downside well enough right now? What's something that you could do about that? If you're already protecting all your downsides, what's currently your lowest gauge or indicator? Money, capability, interest, or impact? And what could you do to ratchet that up? If you're considering the indie path, first, have you built your primary skill set to a place that you can consistently deliver quality work with low supervision? If that's progressing nicely, uh, what's a way that you could start connecting and being helpful to others without leaving your job? How could you start practicing marketing and sales skills? And is it time to make a rough draft for a transition plan? And if you're happily employed, are there any circumstances that might cause you to explore the indie path? What's the likelihood of those occurring? What if you made an investment, however small, in proportion to that likelihood over the next year? After all this, you might still be wondering, why should I care? Especially if you're in that happily employed group. So let me tell you why I care and why I think you should too. First, I care about the developers who need another option. Perhaps childcare responsibilities are making full-time employment difficult. Perhaps a job location requirement is standing in the way of a dream to travel the world. Or perhaps there is no position that quite matches the unique set of skills and interests that someone has and they need to invent their own. Second, while I don't pretend to know the future, it does seem like the world may be moving away from long-term full-time employment as the default. Freelance work has been trending upward, remote async roles are becoming more the norm, and waves of industry layoffs make it apparent that a regular job isn't necessarily a safe job. This likely means both more opportunity and more need for contractors, consultants, fractional workers, and people building products. Finally, I believe our industry in general, and the Ruby community specifically, is better served by diversification. Our community is an ecosystem, 
with many potential niches. Uh, there's a place for large companies building platforms, employing thousands of developers, a place for medium-sized agencies, uh, employing dozens of team members, a place for small product teams, and a place for independent developers. A healthy ecosystem has all of its niches filled, and the Ruby community is healthier and stronger with a population of happy, productive, and profitable indie developers. If this uh, resonates with you and you want to talk more, please reach out to me. I'm certainly not an expert on all of this, but I'm passionate about it, and I enjoy uh, discussing the challenges and sharing what I've learned. Um, I'd love to be a help or encouragement to you if I can. Finally, here are some of the books and resources that have informed this talk and my overall perspective. And here's how you can get in touch with me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Going back. And here's how you can get in touch with me. Thank you.